Welcome to the Future of Work. I'm Katie Tynan, and ordinarily on this show, we talk to people who are part of the emerging freelance economy. But today, we're going to look at the other side of the coin and talk to some colleges and universities who are innovating in their programs to prepare people for this new world of work. So we visited Hampshire College and spoke to President Jonathan Lash and Becker College and spoke to Dr. Robert Johnson about some of the things that they're doing in their curriculum and in their programs to prepare students for the new world of work. So Hampshire was created specifically to be disruptive in a way that totally aligns with what's going on in our economy. It was, I think, uh, a natural but unintended consequence of the Hampshire education that it became a very good way of preparing people for a world in which 70% of the students we have in school today are going to end up in jobs that haven't been invented yet. So what does that mean for an institu institution of higher learning? It means that we have to you know, teach people in a very, very different way. Um, we have to value learning over knowing. We have to help uh, each college graduate to understand what it means to uh, create, develop, uh, and evolve a personal brand because that's going to have to change over the years. We live in a world now where college graduates, depending upon which body of research you look at, will have upwards of 15 jobs by the age of 40. Think about that. 15 jobs by the age of 40. Job training? Job training for what? What was a social media manager seven or eight years ago? That job did not exist. It's got to be in the ability to adapt and change. And I think our students look at change and they see opportunity. You take this thing out 10, 20, 30 plus years. 20 years from now, I was reading in one of the publications that 47% of all of the current jobs will be done by robots. By the end of this century, by the end of this century, 70% 70 70 of all existing jobs will be done by robots. That's pretty phenomenal if you think about it. But what we also know in that same economy, um, the age of the robot, if you will, new jobs and new industries will emerge and people will have to develop the skills that are necessary to evolve and thrive in that type of environment. So at Becker College, what we've tried to do is to create a very innovative, adaptive and nimble model that will help students to to navigate uh, through this malaise uh, throughout the course of their professional careers. I think the people who founded Hampshire, and this was long before my time, I'm, I'm a relatively new president, I think they were passionate about education and learning and about what that meant to society. It was the 70s, so they, they were not so concerned about job training. But it turns out, of course, that the skills are fabulous skills. They're the skills of the entrepreneur. Um, the student in her final year has to go recruit a committee that will work on a year-long single project um, and convince that committee that the question and the project are worth pursuing. Well, that's a basic skill in the modern economy. It's, it's what you do whenever you meet with somebody you want to interview. You have to convince me that it's worth me spending my time with you and then you have to create the opportunity to broadcast what you're doing. In, a, in an economy in which every sector is being completely disrupted, this capacity is really important. I think what's important for Hampshire students is they become deeply politically engaged around the question of culture differences and respect for culture differences and what it what that implies for his what that tells us about history and implies for the future which I actually think is a nice entry point for understanding better the implications for work and, and um, citizenhood. At Becker we're proud of the fact that we are, are a very adaptive and nimble institution uh, that we're very entrepreneurial and innovative. Uh, so for example, we created the Massachusetts Digital Games Institute, MassDigi, uh, which has become a thought leader uh, in the digital games industry. Uh, how did we create that? Uh, we had, I started on July 1 of 2010. In October of 2010, we had a symposium on campus where we brought together thought leaders uh, from academia, uh, from corporate America, uh, and um, from uh, government 
uh, to talk about evolving the, the digital games industry uh, throughout the Commonwealth. Well, in April of 2011, we launched Mass Digi. Uh, how do we do it? Um, we don't do a whole lot of things by large groups and task forces and committees. Um, I think it really starts with people. Uh, at Becker College, when I first arrived five years ago, it was all about the people. How do we find the best people with the best talent to go out and do the job, empower them, and let them do their thing? We, we have a game design course, and the two professors who taught it um, ran it by having students apply as if they were applying for a job to get into the course. And they had to write a cover letter on why they'd be a good member of the team and what they'd contribute, and they had to submit a resume. And then the whole course was organized around different teams creating a game, a game app, which they managed to sell at the end of the course. Uh, well, that's experiential learning. I think a lot of institutions get so caught up into um, what is the governance structure and you know, how do we have a cast of thousands to have input uh, to make a decision that it really slows down the process. What I do know from a management perspective and from a leadership perspective, you will never have 100% of the information to make a good decision. And if you do, by then it's too late to make a good decision. So at Becker, what we try and do is create an adaptive, nimble mindset that enables us to move quickly. Um, we also try and be opportunistic. Too many institutions try and do what they've always done. And somewhere I read just a few months ago that if you do what you've always done, you will do what you've always done. We kind of took on the, um, the Wayne Gretzky model. You know, Wayne Gretzky, when he was being interviewed, asked the question, uh, how is it that you've been so successful to score so many points? He said, well, what I don't do is skate to where the hockey puck is. I try and skate to where I think the hockey puck is going to be. And I think Becker College, with digital games, with Mass Digi, and with all of the things that we've been able to do over the last five years, we've always tried to skate to where the hockey puck is going to be. So as we've just heard, it's a pretty tough job to hit a moving target of the changing needs of the global economy. And these schools are trying to innovate in ways that are allowing them to prepare students for jobs that don't exist yet using technology that hasn't been invented. And so as we'll hear in the next segment, there are different ways that schools can approach that challenge. One of the things we're finding with the current, I guess they call them Generation Z, right? With Generation Z, mm -hmm is that they're not quite so politically active, they're just as idealistic, but they want to get their hands on things and do them. So uh, we have a, a maker space, a design space, it totally oversubscribed, huge numbers of students that want to go invent things. Um, the most oversubscribed course this year was the social entrepreneurship course. Uh, we've created a whole entrepreneurship center because students want to do this work. Now they're not thinking of going and starting a business and becoming multimillionaires. They're just thinking about, I want to create an organization that enables me to do what I care about. And I, I think that's an interesting shift from the highly political students of the 70s. Empathy is the hallmark and the cornerstone of innovation and creativity. So from my perspective, if I'm educating a young person for jobs that do not yet exist to solve problems we have yet to identify, if I teach them how to be creative and innovative, they'll always be in a position where uh, they, they'll be prepared to do that next thing. I have assumptions about privacy that are just inconceivable to our students. It just doesn't occur to them. They, they don't care about it, and I care about it intensely. Um, and I have a set of expectations about what constitutes communication that is very different from theirs. The question is whether 
we can get them to link what they have learned as part of being social beings to their opportunities to create change and generate um, legitimate added value. Um, and also whether we can challenge the idea that everything is technology. How do I understand that I may be working on a project on a job uh, right here in Massachusetts and one of my teammates uh, may be in India, another one may be in Switzerland, and another one may be in Africa. You know, so I have to have social and emotional intelligence and understand how to work uh, collaboratively. My old organization had offices in eight countries and programs in 50 countries. And, you know, we had all the best equipment for uh, having video conferences from four continents at once. And whenever you scheduled something, you were always thinking about how does this fit with Asian time and, and uh, what about the people in Africa? Are they going to have to be up at three in the morning and, and so forth? And that was great in terms of collective work on a project. You, you could have people work together in a way that simply would have been impossible 10 years before. But it didn't substitute for the work of building a common culture and shared values. Uh, and I spent, you know, 17 years traveling 150,000, 200,000 miles a year because I could not find a substitute for interacting directly with people about those fundamental things. Who are we? What matters to us? What do we share? And how do we develop that into a platform for doing something we, we jointly care about? There are three attributes with global citizenship. Uh, academic excellence, social responsibility, and creative expression. Academic excellence, we want them to be competent in whatever their chosen field of study happens to be. Social responsibility, we firmly believe that uh, if you are an educated person uh, on a planet with over seven billion people, then you're privileged. So therefore, you have a social responsibility to go out into the world and leave it better than the way you found it. And then creative expression, that's all about building your personal brand and evolving it throughout your professional career. If you're going to have upwards of 15 jobs by the age of 40, then what is your personal brand? How do you talk about yourself? What is your 30 or 45 second elevator speech? So becoming a global citizen is, is another dynamic in terms of preparing students for the real world that they're going to have to evolve into. So part of my job has been to go out and meet as many of our 9,000 alumni as I can. So I spend a lot of time on the road doing events. Um, and when I go and meet with groups of our alumni, uh, first of all, I notice how intensely networked they are. They are all doing stuff together and talking about stuff together. But second of all, five minutes into the conversation, they're talking about how Hampshire changed their lives. Now, when I meet with my Harvard class, we talk about politics and jobs and maybe our kids. I've never had a conversation about the education. These are young people who are interested in learning and driven by curiosity, but don't want to shape what they learn to what somebody tells them they should learn. Uh, they're not competitive about learning. They think that's all BS. They just want the opportunity to explore and they'd like some help in exploring. Uh, they tend to be driven to want to go very deep into questions. If something intrigues them, they don't want to stop. Um, the one chapter in the book is not enough. Uh, tend to have high levels of empathy, interestingly. That surprised me in teenagers. Um, th these are people who have engaged in some community or another. Um, and when you think of a community made up of people like that, um, you can imagine this process in which all kinds of people are thinking hard about the world around them. And they may be coming up with totally crazy ideas, but they give each other lots of room to do that. There, there is a real supportive atmosphere for being outside the lines and exploring new ideas and thinking, hmm, 
really interested in what the brain looks like when it hears music and finding a way to do that research. Um, <clears throat> I think that's what makes it, them so much fun to be with. Now, some of the ideas are genuinely just zany. Um, <laughs> And that's, I mean, that's okay. That's part of the process. As colleges are facing increasing competition in the marketplace, they're having to adapt what their institution does in order to attract a unique brand of students that can be successful in their organization. So to do that, both presidents focused on not being all things to all people, but rather finding what programs attract students that can thrive within their institutions. We're trying to create um, a very innovative program. So our digital games program, ranked number nine in the world, and number, and number uh, one in New England. And that's a pretty big deal to be number one in New England, given that we're among MIT, Northeastern, WPI, and a host of, of, of other uh, uh, significantly larger uh, institutions. Um, so that's, that's really, really a big deal. Our, our, our animal science program, um, you know, we're one of 10 undergraduate programs uh, in New England uh, that has a four-year degree in the area of animal sciences, uh, but we rank third in the nation in producing vet techs in an undergraduate degree program. Our nursing program uh, ranked number one uh, in New England among private institutions in passage of the NCLEX exam. 100% passage rate. 100%, Kate. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so think about that. So if you get sick and you happen to be in the area, you want to make sure you have a Becker nurse, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just think that that's, that's, that's really important. Have you seen the ad, I think it's for a razor blade, on television where there are a whole bunch of young guys in suits obviously sitting and waiting for a job interview, and one of them looks up and sees a portrait of the founder and his head is shaven, yeah. and he races into the bathroom and shaves his head to look. <laughs> and I, I just look at that and I think, this is all wrong. I mean, I understand the humorous message and so forth, but it's all wrong. The students that I meet, whatever they go and do in the world, are gonna do it for a purpose. Um, where they go is gonna be built around some vision or the mission of some organization, but a strong set of values. And they, to a much higher degree than a lot of people whom I've worked with over my life, just have a clear sense of what they want to do with their lives. And I find that enormously encouraging. One of my priorities for the school has been to be much clearer in communicating what it's about and why it's unique and what it does uh, on the premise that if we can differentiate ourselves, we'll both get, have a much better chance of getting students for whom this is a great experience. Um, and in a crowded marketplace of higher education, we'll be able to compete. Uh, but that involves also saying that we're not trying to appeal to this student who wants to be handed a reading list and told when the exam is and what it takes to get an A. That, that person would not be happy at, at this school. And what we found in the last couple of years is the more we communicate about that and the more we do things that align with those values, saying, okay, we don't give grades and we know that SATs don't predict success at Hampshire. We're just not going to even look at those tests. The more we do that, the more we get a response among prospective applicants and the higher excitement level we get from applicants. So I, I just find that deeply encouraging. What things do we think it's really important we maintain and, and what things are open to change and how would we imagine them? The, the basic uh, pedagogical notion that it should be about learning, not teaching. Uh, that students should take responsibility for their own education and that what's most important is they have the chance to dig really deeply into some 
question that drives them. We think that's right, and we think that that, that will last. Um, in terms of the tools that are available to them and the settings in which they do it and how much of it actually takes place on this campus, I can imagine that changing a lot in the future. Uh, and the, it's important for us to um, be pretty agile in allowing those experiments, half of which will fail, right? Um, and encouraging both students and faculty to invent different approaches. That I see happening, and it, it, it's already started and will continue. I don't want this school, certainly my faculty does not want this school to pursue innovations because they would be cheaper. Right. Uh, now if we find something that is a better opportunity for our students to learn and experiment and also enables us to provide education at a lower cost, of course that's great, but that's the grail that everyone is searching for. Uh, and it's turning out that MOOCs aren't that answer. We're, we're heavy users of MOOCs because a student will meet with his committee and the committee will say you need to explore this issue further and one of the options is to take an online course to do it. That, that's fine. Uh, and they're wonderful tools for reaching people who would never have access to education but they're no substitute for the interaction of that student with his committee. heard at both Becker and Hampshire is the importance of learning the fundamentals of entrepreneurship. So both institutions are creating a strong focus on teaching students both innovation skills and the understanding of the need for failure in the process. We have to be willing to take risk. Don't be afraid to fail because you know if you don't fail early and you fail and you don't fail often uh, then you'll never try to do anything that's different, anything that's, that, that's new. And as long as you learn from those mistakes you are able to pick yourselves up, keep going, pressing forward. It's very much a disruptive innovation model. I think about the 21st century, and I think what characterizes it more than anything else is the pace of change is accelerating, and it's change in everything. It's change in culture. It's change in the way people gain and manage knowledge. It's change in technology. It's certainly change in politics, my, my goodness. Uh, it's environmental change on astonishing and, and daunting levels, certainly change in the way people connect with each other, and it's happening faster and faster. And for me, there is no better education than the one we offer as education for change because the experience from the day the student walks onto the campus is taking charge and adapting to the combination of what's around you and what you want to find out. That's learning how to learn, but it's also educating for change. Today we've seen how colleges are reinventing themselves to better prepare students for careers in the global economy. The challenge for those institutions is how to do that without losing their core values. The challenge for students is how to apply those lessons to the rapidly changing workforce. I'm Katie Tynan. Thanks for joining us today on The Future of Work, and we'll see you next time.